My name is Eric Winter. I'm a uh, fish biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm also the project leader for what's called the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. Most people just call it the Pike Minnow Program. And let's see, I've been with Washington for since the inception of this program back in 1991. This is our 25th season. And so I've been here for all the different seasons uh, back to 1991, uh, starting out as a technician, moving up to a supervisor, and now I'm actually the project leader, which is responsible for the whole program uh, from the mouth of the Columbia all the way up to uh, Priest Rapids Dam and on the Snake River from the mouth all the way up to Hell's Canyon Dam. So the, the folks that you would come in contact with out there at the check stations, whether it's on the Oregon side or on the Washington side, those are all my folks. So what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight is I'm going to give you the nuts and bolts, how to, you know, participate in the program, why we're doing the program, and then I'm hopefully going to show you a little bit about how to catch them, where to go, that sort of thing. In a perfect world, by the time you leave tonight, I'll have answered all your questions. Feel free to ask questions as we go, although I have found that what happens is whatever your question is, usually about two slides right after that, that's where I have the answer. But if you really need to ask, feel free. Anyway, that being said, I will go ahead. Everybody's got one of the, uh, the handout packets. We've got those in the back. Uh, if you don't, uh, Steve back there will make sure you get them. And that being said, let's, let's take off. All right, this is your picture you were talking about. Hopefully you can see it. It's a little bleached out here, but this is a northern pike minnow. Uh, years ago, it used to be called a northern squawfish. Then along about the year 2000, a bunch of really super smart uh, fishery scientists decided, well, we can't be having a fish called a northern squawfish, so they changed the name to northern pike minnow. Either way, it's the same fish. It's a native fish. It's always been here. It's in most of the streams, rivers, lakes, a lot of the reservoirs here in the Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, British Columbia, that sort of thing. It's not an introduced fish. It's always been there. The trouble is that on the Columbia River, once you start putting up these big concrete structures like this, uh, it changes the, the pike minnow habitat. And so there's only one math problem tonight for the whole presentation, and this is it. If you put a whole bunch of baby salmon and steelhead smolts together, you add them together with the, the main fish predator of baby salmon and steelhead, what do you get? Well, here is the answer. Uh, this particular fish was caught at the mouth of the Klickitat River, and as often happens with these predators, they will uh, gorge on the food supply that's in front of them once they've been caught a lot of times the trauma of being caught, thrown in the boat, into a cooler, maybe accidentally getting bonked on the head or something like that, causes them to regurgitate what it is they've been eating. And here is the evidence, uh, a, a number of uh, juvenile salmonids that this particular fish uh, ate. So the program is funded by Bonneville Power Administration. Those big concrete structures that I showed you a couple slides ago, uh, because of, of the damage that those caused to Northwest Salmon and Steelhead runs, Bonneville Power has to finance projects such as this, which help uh, Salmon and Steelhead. It's a cooperative program between the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, as I mentioned, we're the folks that you're going to run into at the check-in stations when you're out there signing up and or turning in your fish. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, as I mentioned before, it's a native fish and they do what's called the biological evaluation of the program. Because it's a native fish, we're not trying to eradicate this fish, we're just trying to crop that population down to more of historic levels. Well, the only way you can do that is by tagging some of these fish and based on the tag recoveries you get, you can estimate what portion of the population you're taking. So in our pro program, we're trying to get 10 to 20% of the population. So Oregon tags a bunch of these fish based on the recoveries. That's where we get our estimate of what portion of the overall population we're taking. From your point of view as prospective pike minnow anglers, why is that important? 
those tags are worth extra dollars. So if you happen to catch a tagged fish, it's worth above and beyond what the base reward is. And I'll tell you the reward here in just a sec. Also, the uh, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, they administer the overall program. And more importantly, I guess from your point of view, once again, as prospective anglers, uh, they're the ones that actually send you the checks once you turn in the fish. Now the program boundaries are on the Columbia River from the mouth all the way up to Priest Rapids Dam, which is above the Tri-Cities. It's also in effect on the Snake River from the mouth of the Snake all the way up to Hell's Canyon Dam. So it's a huge program area. Within those areas, we have all these different check-in points, which are areas where you could sign up and turn in fish. All these black dots represent the check-in points within those areas. Our technicians are at each of those locations every day from May 1st through September 30th at specific hours every day. And so I'm going to tell you how you, how you go about registering, how you go about finding them, that sort of thing. Now hopefully everybody's had a chance to look through the packets that you got. Uh, there's a number of what I assume are useful pieces of information in there. One of the most important ones, or, or mo most interesting ones, I guess, would be kind of the lime green uh, sheet, which gives you a summary of the 2014 season. So on the front portion of that, it's going to show you what's called registration stations. That corresponds to all those different dots on the map. It'll also give you the number of fish that were caught at each of those locations. It'll give you the average catch per angler, which is called CPUE. It'll also give you the number of tags that were turned in at that particular location. So that's one way that you might choose what area to fish. For example, the Dow station was our top station in 2014. We had over 30,000 fish turned in just at that one location. But if you look at the, the CPUE column, the catch per angler, it's not necessarily the best catch per angler. So you can see other stations are, are better. There's less people, uh, more fish, and so that might be a location that appeals to you. There's also the 2015 uh, Catch More Cash brochure, which gives you a little bit picture of that map. It gives you the, the hours of operation, although there are a couple typos in that, in that brochure. So double check on the, on the website or on the blue sheet, which has the correct hours for each location. There's also a $10 coupon, so that's why I was uh, telling these two young men here in the front row that everybody should get a packet because each of you gets a coupon. What that is, is if you go out and catch a pike minnow, if you turn that coupon in with your pike minnow, your first fish is worth an extra $10. So instead of a $5 fish, it's a $15 fish, just as a way to kind of help get you started, get you into the flow of the pike minnow program. Uh, there's also another brochure which is finding and catching pike minnow and as we're going to talk about here in a little bit, finding pike minnow is really the hardest thing about catching pike minnow. They'll take a lot of different baits and lures but you got to figure out how to find them and then how to find them consistently. So that's kind of the secret there. The blue sheet is station directions, that's just driving directions how to get to those check-in points to sign up or turn in fish. And the last one I have is the uh, pink sheet which tells you how to tell the difference between a pike minnow and some of the fish that look like it. Because every year we get a bunch of young folks like these gentlemen here that have dollar signs in their eyes and they go out and they catch a bunch of fish and they come in with a bucket of fish and it ends up being this other fish which is called a pea mouth which looks like a pike minnow but it doesn't eat baby salmon or steelhead, it's not hurting anything and it's not worth any money. So we don't want to disappoint kids so try to show them which one is which. All right. Let's cut to the chase. The dollar wise, for uh, the 2015 season, we have a new reward structure. It's been 10 years since there's been any change to the reward. So the base reward has gone up from $4 each to $5 each. It's also been 20 years since we've done anything with the structure, which allows you to get to the higher tier levels quicker or easier for that matter. So the, the end goal is that it should be theoretically easier for you to go out there catch fish and get up to that higher tier level, that 200 fish limit, which is the $8 fish. In past years, it had taken 400 fish to get up to that $8 level. And so 
we're hoping that a lot more anglers spend a, little, a lot more time and, and are able to get up to that $8 level. Now those tagged fish I mentioned, those are worth $500. Now the tag is just right here. It's a little, it's a little piece of wire. It looks like, kind of like a little piece of electrical wire. They can be a couple of different colors. Typically they're going to be kind of a, a real baby blue color in recent years. If you look real close on it, it's going to say ODFW, it's going to have the Clackamas address, it's going to have a tag number, that sort of thing. If it's been in the fish for very long, it also may have a lot of algae or dirt or scum or whatever on it, so it may be kind of hard to read. And if you're fishing in the evening or, or at night, you could even miss seeing that fish potentially. So one of the things we do when you turn in your fish is we're looking them over to see if there are any tags. and Anyway, if you get a fish with a tag like that, leave the tag intact, bring that in with the rest of your catch, turn that in, and that is most likely a $500 fish. Makes for a really good day, really good week. It's almost as good as catching a nice salmon, I guess. Um, as far as the overall rewards that the program offers, what I'm trying to show here is just the, the idea is typically our reward fund is somewhere between a million, million and a half dollars uh, historically. Last year, there were 1,186,000 plus dollars given out to pike minnow anglers. How does that break out as far as the uh, average angler? Well, not the average angler. These are the above average anglers. These are the top 10. Now, this list is also on that, that lime green sheet. And this kind of shows you what serious pike minnow anglers are capable of doing uh, number of fish catch wise and also dollar wise. Now all these guys to be on this top list, it's taken them a lot of years. Most of them have been fishing five, six, eight, 12, 20 some years on the pike minnow program. It, it's not a hard fish to catch, but it is kind of hard to kind of learn. You know, if you spend a little bit of time and effort, you can learn how to catch these fish successfully. Realistically, you're probably not gonna be anywhere on the top 10 or 20 list in the first year or two, but if you give it a couple of years, couple of seasons, and work at it, uh, you do have a chance to, to get as high on that list as, as you want. The average pike minnow angler catches between eight and nine fish per angler per day. But like any fishery, you've got 10% of the guys catching 80% of the fish. So don't get discouraged if you go out and you get a zero, or you get small fish, or you're having a little bit of trouble, because that's pretty, that's pretty typical. It just takes a little bit of a learning curve so I'm hoping I can point you in the right direction here. Now in order to uh, participate you do have to have a fishing license um, in Oregon or Washington unless you're a, a juvenile they have their separate regulations for that. Uh, you, you do need to sign up at one of those check-in locations prior to going fishing. You also need to fish within those program boundaries so that's the Columbia River, the main stem Columbia, from the mouth up to Priest Rapids Dam, Snake River from the mouth up to Hell's Canyon Dam. You are allowed to fish the mouths of any of the tributaries within that area, 400 feet up from the mouth of any of the tributaries within that area, but that's, that is the program area as defined by BPA and the overall program rules. Of course, you do have to obey current fishing regulations, which typically is one rod, one line with up to three hooks. So I always get the questions about the DuPont spinners or the nets or this or that. And nope, there's a, can't use those. Uh, one line, it's a sport reward fishery. Then you do have to bring your fish back to the same location you signed up um, the next day, typically. But question back there? Uh, three hooks, you mean single hooks or treble hooks? Or it, can, it, it can be up to three treble hooks. Right. A treble counts as a hook. And the other question I get as far as Columbia River is, is ha having to do with the barbs. And if you're pike minnow fishing, you can fish with barbed hooks. The, the only difference or the potential trouble is if you happen to catch a legal salmon or steelhead, you would have to release that. But other than that, you can pike minnow fish with barbed hooks. Okay, so they have to be nine inches total length. So that's tip of the snout to tip of the tail to be eligible for the reward. The reason it's nine inches is, once again, we're not trying to eradicate this fish, but at nine inches, that's where these fish start to become predatory, 
towards juvenile salmonids. Prior to that, they're eating smaller insects and such, and they're native fish, and we're not trying to eradicate them, so we're just trying to get the bigger ones. Okay, we do also want you to, to uh, take care of your fish, keep them on ice or in a cool condition. The technicians that you turn them into are going to be taking biological data, and for us to get accurate data, the fish need to be in, in good condition. So you want to make sure you put them on ice, keep them in a cooler, a live well, something like that. The cheapest, easiest way to do it is to just get a couple of two liter soda jugs, freeze those, put those in your cooler with your fish and those will be fine. You can use a stringer early in the year when that water temperature is cool, but once it starts to get kind of into the 60s or above, that's really not so good for keeping fresh fish. So you're gonna pretty much have to use ice at that point. It doesn't have to be this ice like this. Um, but uh, those soda jugs work really good. Now as far as signing up, you do need to sign up before you go, so you go to one of those check-in points. We're there specific hours every day, May 1st through September 30th. Um, if we're not there, there is a night registration box at each of those locations that you can self-register prior to us getting there or after we leave in the evening. The hours that we will be there are posted right on the front of the box. So let's say we're gonna be there from 9 a.m. to noon. If you came in between 9 a.m. and noon, we would sign you up and ask you, do you wanna turn in tomorrow? Or do you wanna turn in by the time we leave at noon? Now most people are gonna say, well, I'll turn them in tomorrow because two or three hours of fishing probably isn't that good. Or you could, leave, you could sign up after we leave at noon, so at 12.30 or whatever, you wouldn't have to turn your fish in until the following day by the time we leave at noon. Does that make sense? So you'd have up to potentially a little over 24 hours. All right, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts about why we're doing it, how to, how to actually sign up uh, and actually participate. So now I'm, I'm gonna shift gears and kind of turn over a uh, new leaf and, and talk about how to catch them because in the end, that's kind of the, the uh, secret, I guess. There's two ways for pike minnow fishing, as always, uh, boat fishing and bank fishing. One illustration I would give you is on that lime green sheet, the top 20 anglers there. There is one guy out of that top 20 that's a bank angler. So realistically, if you have aspirations on being a top 20 angler, you're probably going to need a boat. Doesn't mean you can't do it from shore, it's just you have uh, limited areas that you can, more limited areas that you can fish from shore than you do with a boat. You can cover more territory with a boat and that allows you to be a lot more effective. As far as access from shore, uh, especially in the Portland, Vancouver area, it's, it's kind of limited. There's a lot of private property. There's some public docks and such. Um, oftentimes these docks have a lot of people fishing there and if they are great fishing places, there's a lot of people there too and so either way your odds of catching a whole bunch of pike minnow from any of these locations is probably not that great but at least it does get you on the river. To be really productive or successful pike minnow fishing from shore you're probably going to want to fish on the downstream side of one of the dams whether it's Bonneville Dam, John Day Dam, McNary Dam, uh, the Dalles Dam, any of those. This particular picture is up at the John Day Dam, and this angler here is actually the one angler on the top 20 that is the shore angler. <laughs> so what he's doing is, is he's casting soft plastics below the dam and drifting those like you would steelhead fishing, and I'll, sh I'll show you that setup here in just a second. But realistically, if you really want to do well, get up by one of the dams. Um, otherwise, boat is the way to go, and it's just Pure and simple, you can just cover more territory. These fish move around a lot. The, the biggest secret to, to catching them is finding them and finding them consistently. If you find them today and you're getting a bunch of fish, that doesn't mean they're gonna be there tomorrow. They, they move around a lot. They follow the food supply, uh, spawning season, the water uh, temperature, the water fluctuation, all these things cause these fish to move. They're kind of an ambush predator, so they're always looking for food, uh, kind of cruising around. They're not just kind of sitting still much. As far as rod and reel, um, I don't really have a specific recommendation on bait casting or spinning. What I would tell you is that use, use a rod that you are comfortable with and you are competent with. 
because it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of repetitive motion. You don't want to be spending a bunch of time messing with a bait casting reel if you've never fished with one because you're you know, dealing with bird's nests and that sort of thing. If you're unable to cast with a bait casting reel, it may be better to use a spinning uh, reel, that sort of thing. Whatever you're comfortable with and competent with, that's the best way to go. Medium action is, is a good place to start. These fish average about a pound and a half a piece, but it's not uncommon for them to get up to that, that three, four, five pound range, especially up close to the dams. So you wanna have enough rod to deal with that. They're not super strong fighters. They do hit like a ton of bricks often on lures, but they, I guess their downside is that they, they give up fairly quickly and especially the warmer the water is, they may hit like a ton of bricks, you think you have a steelhead, and then it's just kind of dead weight reeling it in because they give up. But either way, you want to go as light as you can that you're comfortable with, but you don't want to spend a whole lot of time retying um, and uh, hooking up, snagging, that sort of thing. <clears throat> now I would also say that over the last 24 seasons, uh, more pikemen have been caught with bait than any other method. These are probably the top four pike minnow baits. Uh, worms are a great pike minnow bait. The downside for worms, of course, is that they catch pike minnow, they catch sturgeon, they catch sculpin, they catch bass, they, everything. Everything likes worms. Uh, crawdad, same type of deal. Very good bait. It takes a little bit of work to get them. Uh, lots of other fish like them. Some of them are good. Steelhead love crawdads, for example. Uh, salmon eggs, that's really also a good pike minnow bait. In recent years, it's really kind of turned out that fresh, uncured salmon or steelhead eggs really seems to be a real outstanding pike minnow bait. It's not that you can't catch them with cured eggs, it's just fresh, uncured, just seems to be that much better. So a lot of our top anglers, what they'll do is they'll go up and, and buy a five gallon bucket full of salmon eggs, for example, from one of the fish processing plants or from the, the tribal uh, anglers further up the river. And if they have fresh bait, like a lot of fisheries, you're doing way better catching than if you have just okay bait. So it really does make a huge difference. Now fresh chicken liver is the, probably the most popular bait going back 24 years. Doesn't mean it's the best bait, but it is by far the most popular bait. You can get it at a lot of different places, Albertsons or Safeway or whatever. It's a little bit tough to work with because it's a super soft bait. Uh, you, need to, you need to tie it on your hook with an egg loop. You want to probably double wrap that thing with a couple of loops. It's, if you don't keep it cold, it also will fall apart and so it's not uncommon to, to cast out and your hook goes this way and the bait goes that way and so that's never a good thing. Hard to catch fish with no bait. <clears throat> But if you keep it cold right up until the time you put it on your hook, uh, that helps and then do that, do that egg loop as well. And that's a good place to start lure wise or bait wise. Now, recent years, another bait that's really come on strong is these juvenile shad. Uh, as you know, this time of year, we've got the adult shad moving up the river and a lot of folks are out catching those, which is always fun. But along about late middle to late August, uh, these juveniles start moving down and these pikemen will really seem to key in on these things. And, and my theory is that you've got a long, cold winter coming up. You've got a ready food, food supply. You've got millions of these things. And so the pikemen are just gorging on these things. Now you can catch these juvenile shad in, in the shallows, the quiet backwaters. Um, in, at that time of year, you'll see them kind of jumping, rolling, dimpling the, the surface. And usually you use just one of those, those super small little uh, flies. Oh, I don't, I, I don't know what size they are, but they're like mosquito size. They're ridiculously small. And I don't think there's any way I could tie one of those on my hook, but maybe you glue it or something, I don't know. But if you get those baits, it's an excellent bait. The only caveat is that both Washington and Oregon uh, require it to be a dead fish. You can't fish them alive. So just make sure we know that. The other one uh, that's good to know, which probably doesn't do the average angler around here a whole lot of good is, is uh, what's called a Mormon cricket. Now these are, are really a sought after pike minnow bait, especially on the east side, Was eastern Washington, eastern Oregon. There's only one place that I know you can get these consistently and it's an area by the Tri-Cities called the Juniper Dunes. 
and a lot of our pike minnow anglers over there will fish for pike minnow six days of the week and on the seventh day they'll spend the day collecting these crickets because it just makes that much of a difference. If you have a good bait, like a lot of fisheries, it makes a huge difference for whether you just catch your average or, or, or a little below average or if you're one of the, one of the better anglers because bait, bait is a huge thing. Now the, the trouble with these particular crickets, I guess, or at least another warning would be that uh, they are a bait that bites back. <laughs> so be careful, they got big old gnarly mandibles on them and when you, they don't like having a hook stuck in them, and so when you do that, if they can get a hold of you, they will, and they will draw blood, so be careful. Uh, the other thing about them is that they are cannibalistic, so if you go out and you catch yourself a hundred of them and you don't keep them chilled in a cooler with some ice, uh, you may catch a hundred, but when you open it up a little later, you might have four, so, but they're an excellent bait despite the trouble. Now if you were going pike minnow fishing with, with bait, this would be like the perfect pike minnow bait cooler. If you could have all these things, that would be a fully stocked tackle box. So just like we were talking here, you have the juvenile shad, you've got your night crawlers, you've got your chicken livers. A lot of our anglers are doing well, especially late in the year, so that'll be mid-August through September, using what we call salmon guts, and that's going to mean uh, salmon or steelhead hearts, livers, bloodlines, uh, milt sacks, uh, that sort of thing, and you're just rigging that like a, like a typical bait setup. You're using a hook with a slider. This is, obviously isn't to scale you're gonna hopefully or preferably use a braided main line. Uh, typically, you're gonna use maybe a, a 10 to 15 pound braided line. You're gonna use maybe a six or eight pound leader, something like that. Once again, you wanna go as light as you're comfortable with, but not so light that you're breaking off all the time. I mean, there's, there's snags and this and that there, and if you're spending all your time retying, that's time lost where you're not bait in the water catching pike minnow. The guys that are really into this, they're almost like those professional bass anglers so that they'll have several rods rigged up and they're, they hook a fish, they're reeling it in. As that fish comes over the side of their boat, they're grabbing their other hand and they're taking another rod and dropping it right back down there because they really want to maximize their time with a bait you know, on fish that are biting. They're trying to really stay on it. If that means staying there till midnight or till 3 a.m., they're going to do it because they know that the fish may or may not be there tomorrow. So they, they want to get all the time, all the fish out of it that they can. As far as weight, it's going to depend on the depth. It's going to depend on the speed of current. Most of the time when you're trying to find fish, you're going to want to go with a, a lighter lead that allows you to cover some area. Once you've located fish, so you know they're in this spot, for example, you could use a little heavier weight and fish uh, like, they would, like they would say for plunking where you have basically you just cast out and that, that weight and bait are sitting right on the bottom. So that would be okay. Other than that, you kind of want to make sure you drift it. And the idea with the slider, of course, is that you want to feel the fish before the fish feels you so that you can set the hook and, and hopefully catch that thing. Now you can also go artificial lures. Uh, there's a couple ways you can go there plastics and hardware is just kind of how I break them out. As far as plastics, um, these are some of the common pike minnow plastics and I'll, I'll show you a better picture here but in addition to the sport reward fishery I also have a crew of guys that fishes off the Dalles and, and John Day Dam for these pike minnow and this particular lure here this is called a tube bait which is a gets it. That, that's their primary lure for fishing off those dams. Now they don't, they don't get paid a per fish reward, they're just paid an hourly rate, but the report that we do on that fishery is available on our website, pikeminnow.org, so you can actually go there and you can see year by year what the best colors and sizes are in that particular lure right there. So that's a really good resource as well. You can, you can fish that on a lead head jig for the, for the grubs or with a two hook set up for the tube baits. 
Now this setup here, that fella that I showed you that was uh, casting from shore, this is a setup like he uses. He's using a sliding egg sinker that actually goes up into the, the uh, tube bait. Depending on the water speed and the depth, you may use an additional egg sinker on the upstream side because you want to cast that thing out. You want it to get to the bottom as quickly as possible, but not anchor there. You want it to swing along just like you would steelhead drift fishing, get to the bottom as quick as it can, and then tick along the bottom without actually hanging up. The fish are generally oriented towards the bottom, towards structure. Now you can also use uh, crankbait, spinners, spoons, all those things. The downside with those is, especially with crankbaits for example, is if you're fishing with those they will catch pike minnow, but it's a big river, there's a lot of logs, a lot of sticks, a lot of big giant sturgeon, and if you lose too many five, six dollar crankbaits, pretty soon you start thinking about how much you're in the hole with these five or six dollar crank baits and not about the pike minnow that, that you're trying to catch and so you get a little frustrated. It's a lot easier to stick with something that's a little more economical like bait or plastics. One of the things that these all have in common though is that they're imitating kind of a pike minnow food supply. So whether it's juvenile salmonids or the theory is on these tube baits, uh, one of the other items that these pike minnow feed on are juvenile lamprey which are a lot of people call them baby eels. So the, the idea is that maybe those look like those. Uh, that's also a way you can fish night crawlers, just incidentally. You can fish them lengthwise with a two, ho two hook setup. And one of those top 20 anglers, that's one of the ways he likes to fish a lot. And his theory is exactly that, that those, those uh, lengthwise night crawlers are imitating those juvenile lamprey. And when the pike minnow are gorging on those, they'll be spitting those up. Uh, in your boat or in your cooler as well, so kind of keep your eyes open for that. Now pike minnow biology, that's probably a good thing to know too because finding them, that's the hard part. First thing you want to know is that pike minnow are not super strong swimmers. They can swim in a burst really well, so they're really strong just for, for a, a brief period of time, but they're not the type of fish that's strong enough to just hold in a heavy current. What they're going to want to do is have kind of an ambush point somewhere where they have a little bit of slower water with access to fast water where they can see the food supply coming. We use some of these fish at the sportsman show in, a, in an aquarium and it's kind of interesting if you watch these fish, their eyes are, they're always moving, they're scanning, they're looking around, they're, ver they're really a alert fish. And so if you picture a fish like that down near the bottom behind a boulder or a piling or something like that, they're waiting for that food supply to come along. Then they dart out there in that, that burst, grab their, their food supply, and then go back to their little hiding spot. So what you guys are doing is you want to find those, those kind of ambush points. Some of the areas that, that would provide those type of things are uh, side channels, uh, current breaks, little areas like that where you have two different speeds of of current. Uh, we have a little bit slower water on one side, a little faster water on the other side. Uh, could also be drop-offs, could be boulders, that sort of thing. Somewhere where those pike minnow can hide and ambush their food supply. In the lower Columbia, the uh, Portland, Vancouver area, we have a lot of these wing dams, these rows of pilings that stick out into the river. Those are classic pike minnow ambush points. So. It provides you that current seam right there where the uh, pike minnow can be on the, right on that edge, right on that slower side. They've got a food supply coming down. They can dart out there and then go right back to their hiding spot. They will also be in this area at times. Also, as that water comes downstream, when it hits these pilings, it kind of slows down and creates like a little, little bit of a bubble just on that upstream side of these pilings and oftentimes that water is just a little bit slower so you'll find pike minnow just right right up here so you got to be careful fishing it of course if you're boat fishing because getting your boat up against these wing dams that can be a, a bad deal mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's also an effective spot to try likewise there's a little bubble just right off that tip same type of deal where there's a little bit extra slow water that kind of extends a little bit past that 
So if I were going to fish wing dams, for example, that would be a, that would be a real good strategy. I'd, I'd probably fish the best water first. I'd fish that crease. I'd probably fish back through here. I'd fish off the tip and then I'd fish the top and then I'd move on to the next wing dam. So that's a good pike minnow strategy if you're trying to learn is maybe launching, planning on fishing the wing dams for half a day, just working your way down a shoreline, cross over and then fish the wing dams coming up the other side. You're not going to want to spend a whole lot of time in any one given area if the fish are either there or they're not there and if they're there they're either biting or they're not biting. It's not the type of fish that you're going to wait around half a day and they're going to show up and start biting. It, you're better off spending half hour, 45 minutes tops at any one spot. If nothing's going on, if you're catching other species or you're not catching anything, move. And it doesn't mean you have to move a mile. It just means, you know, move 100 yards, move a little deeper, move a little shallower, move up, move down, you know, one way or another, kind of keep moving and as you start to locate fish you'll be able to kind of zero in on those spots but if you stay too long at one spot you may be in the right spot but at the wrong time of day and if the if the fish aren't biting you're just it's hard to learn that way one other good way to go is right now the dow station for example is our top station um, we just got a thousand fish just yesterday for example uh, it, it's basically what we would call from pike minnow point of view red hot. Um, <clears throat> if you had a boat and went up there to the Dalles right now, you would see probably 40 boats, assuming it's not super windy, but they'd all be pike minnow fishing, they'd be catching pike minnow, and from a learning point of view that, that's really helpful because you're in a spot that you know they're pike minnow, you know they're being caught, so if you're not catching them you kind of know what the what the uh, problem is, it's you. You gotta, you gotta figure out, all right, what are these guys doing that I'm not doing? So whether it's bait, whether it's depth, that sort of thing, it really helps the learning curve to fish in an area that, that fish are actually being caught, at least from a learning point of view. <coughs> then once you start to get it figured out a little bit, then yes, I would go look for those areas, other places that aren't as many people. But, but strictly from a learning point of view, it'd probably be well worth a trip up there uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit big water, so be careful. You're going to want to have a, an adequate sized boat. Um, pick your days. If it's super windy, for example, you're not going to want to go out in a in a small skiff, a 12 or 14 foot. But uh, there are a lot of days that it's flat calm, and most of the fishing is just right out right out front of the uh, boat ramp. It's really easy to watch them. A good pair of binoculars is a, a super useful tool also uh, for learning this. Also keep in mind that rocks and boulders, uh, whether they're exposed like this or if they're underwater, they really provide those, those ambush points for pike minnow. So you picture the bottom, there's a lot of ups and downs, there's dips, there's boulders, all those sort of things. They got to have the current to bring them the food supply so they don't really want the frog water. So you want some current but you want places where they can hide and you want to work those type of areas. Even if the water looks slow like above some of the dams or when the tide is in, it, it slows down quite a bit. Uh, there are still little current breaks, and you want to look for those. Look for bird activity. A lot of times the birds are looking for the same thing the pikemen are. They're looking for those, those uh, smolts. Uh, that's a real good clue. One of our top guys a few years ago, we went and watched him uh, do some fishing, and it was very interesting because he went out. He didn't even bother fishing. He was fishing. Uh, below kind of between Woodland and Ridgefield and he didn't even start fishing until that tide turned enough so that his boat was actually pointed the bow the uh, stern was pointed upstream and then once that tide turned the boat all the way around he started casting out those salmon guts like I was telling you about and we he was 13 feet of water and nothing special just we watched him catch fish after fish after fish after fish so that's one of those things to just be aware of. Back eddies, another classic pike minnow area. The, the theory there is it's sort of like that tide thing. Uh, that water comes in and it's just doing like a big toilet bowl sort of thing. And smolts, as they're moving downstream, they get caught up in that. And as they're going around, it just makes them easy pickings for, for pike minnow. 
Pikemen will figure that out. I mean, that's, that's their business, being a predator. Creek mouths, a uh, couple of things going on there. You've got, the, you've got the two different speeds of current. Oftentimes, you've also got a food supply coming out of that creek, you know, whether it's uh, baby salmon or steelhead, something like that. Once again, pikemen will figure those out real quick. Uh, side channels, those are another ones to watch. Especially early in the year in the lower river, a lot of times these side channels will warm up a little bit quicker than the main channel. And pike minnows seem to, they spawn when that water temperature gets about 62 degrees. And the closer they can get to 62, the, the happier they are. So if you're out there the first part of May and you're in a side channel that's half a degree warmer than the main channel, a lot of times that's, the pike minnow figure that out too. And it just a small difference will draw them in there. Once again, they're not going to want the frog weather. They're still going to need some kind of a food supply. So they're going to want some current. But you're going to want to look for those temperature differences as a way to maybe find some. Man-made abutments, don't forget those. Uh, a lot of different places that, that man created that uh, just make classic pike minnow hangouts, ambush points. I would mention that if you're catching other fish that are predators like bass or walleye or something, uh, they don't seem to mix really good. So if you're catching bass, you don't necessarily, you don't usually catch pike minnow and vice versa. So if you're catching bass, if you want to catch bass, great. But if you don't, keep moving. Um, as far as additional resources that we have on our website, we do also have these fishing maps available. So you can, you can check out the website. The idea there is that We've got fish icons for areas that have been productive pike minnow fishing locations in the past. You got to keep in mind though that just because it was a good pike minnow spot last year doesn't mean it's going to be this year. This water, this year obviously the water looks like it's going to be a low water year. Our pike minnow anglers typically do better in low water years. And as of Monday, for example, we were about 8,500 fish ahead of where we were this time a year ago. And so it's sizing up to be a pretty good season from a pike minnow point of view. But at least this will give you kind of some starting points. So look on that website at the area that you want to fish and maybe you can get some ideas and start to plan a little bit of a, your trip to go out there. Other than that, you just, you got to kind of get that, that Keep looking mentality, uh, go out and try it. We have our, our hotline, we have our, our technicians that are out at the different locations as a resource. So once you go out and try it, if, if you're not having luck or if you have some questions, that would be a good place to stop in. Our technicians, out, they're out there every day so they can tell you specifically what's going on right then and there. So that, that's a good resource. Um, you can call our hotline if you need some additional information. We'll try to point you in the right direction. We can't really tell you where the top guy is fishing that particular day. Uh, they frown on that, but we will point you in the right direction. So just like I was saying earlier, the Dalles, if, if I were going to learn, that's where I would uh, start out right now. All right, well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.